All right, hey, welcome. We're gonna do lab number three. And lab number three is a projectile motion and it's really kind of a, a, a fun lab. It's really fun in, in person. So uh, the in-person class just got done. They had a good time doing it here. So let's see how ours comes out. And again, like all of these labs, you know, I'll be the person who does the hands-on thing and you'll be the person who does some calculations and does the thinking and ultimately turns in uh, the lab assignment and ultimately gets gets a grade here. So let's talk about projectile motion kind of in review here. Uh, let's say I have an object and I'll start with it right here and I'll just make a little round object. The reason being is for our lab here we're going to shoot this little yellow ball across the room. Okay, a couple times actually. And so this will be my starting point. Uh, the ball will get launched up at some initial velocity and some angle theta. It's going to go across the room and since we're shooting it from up on a table, it's going to then land on the lab floor which is going to be lower than where it starts. Now, as you heard me say quite a few times, when you do these calculations, make sure that you make it clear in your mind where you're going to put the origin. Now, the little lab instructions that I sent you with this video have this is the front page and then some more stuff on the back so that's coming up but on this page they go through the mathematical derivation and I'll just note that your author picks the launching point as the origin so I'm gonna follow suit with that you can vary it if you want but I would encourage you not to for today's lab to call this the launch point because if you then go to do some calculations and you put X and Y like we've been learning with our projectile motion you can say that the initial position in the X direction is zero and also the initial position in the Y is zero okay now, also, as you've seen us do a number of times, we can take the velocity initial and the angle and make the x component. Uh, maybe I'll put it over here on the side. Since we've done this quite a bit, I'm guessing that you're getting pretty good at it. And that the x component then would be the cosine function and for the sine function we would get the vertical speed. So moving V naught over to the other side of the equation we can say up here that the initial velocity in the x direction is the initial velocity cosine theta and initial velocity in the y direction is the total initial velocity times sine theta. And so that's kind of our standard projectile motion and that's what this lab's about is to give you some experience, some more experience working with projectile motion. Uh, now, the other thing we know, since it's a projectile and it's under the effect of gravity, we know the accelerations. Well, maybe I should put that in here too. So the acceleration in the x direction is zero and the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And so if we apply the equation x equals x naught plus v naught xt 
plus one half ax t squared. Starting with the idea that the acceleration is zero, so that term goes away. The initial position is zero, so that term goes away. We have x equals v naught cosine theta t. And that, maybe I'll put a little circle around uh, to say is the mathematical equation representing the position of the flying object at any moment in time given the firing angle and the initial velocity. Doing that same logic here would be y equals to y naught plus initial velocity y times t plus one half a y t squared. So in our case, only one of them is zero for the, for the y direction. And so we would get y equals, and here I can put vy sine theta t. And then over here, I can put a minus 4. 0.9, that's what happens when I put the 1 half together with the negative 9.8, and then a t squared. Okay. And uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, Ron says, I'll put the units here real small, but I don't, I don't want to put them in our calculations because we're going to have a quadratic and it's probably better without the units in the calculations. Okay. Uh, and let me put a little circle around that. Because that's the general idea of projectile motion. Let's look at what we're asked to do first. And so taking the lab manual here, and, or lab sheet, and turning it over to the back side here, it says this. Step one, determine the initial velocity of the projectile when you fire it horizontally. That is, theta equals zero. Okay. So I should probably show you the equipment. Here's the equipment. It's this little spring-loaded cannon. Uh, you put the ball in there, you push it in, and when you pull the release string, it fires. <laughs> and in this case, it just shot it across the room there. And so this is what is called our cannon. It's a little spring-loaded cannon. And uh, I'm going to change the angle just a little bit so that I hit more of the door. And I'll kind of show you again. And of all the labs, this is the funnest one to do in person. I got to say, this is fun. Just to pull this and watch it fly across the room. And in this case, I'm hitting the door and it's bouncing off here. So this is our cannon. And remember what I just read about the procedure. It says, first fire it at zero degrees. So I have some wing nuts over here on the side that will allow me to change my cannon and I have a plumb bob on the side that allows me to measure this angle. And I think I'm at zero degrees. I'm going to come over to this side so I can see it a little better. Yep, zero degrees. So I've done what they've asked, which is to set up my cannon at zero degrees. And then it says, find the initial velocity. Well, how's that going to work? Well, watch this. If you come over here and set the angle at zero degrees, and then you fire it and see where it lands, we can then measure how far horizontally did it go and how far vertically did it drop. 
And if you look closely then, if you know these three things, and you come over to this equation, you can put in sine of zero, which hopefully is easy for you, that's zero. So that term goes away. And then if you also put in the y value that you measured, you're going to have an equation here that only has time. So you could then use the vertical equation to calculate the time it is in the air. And then, kind of like our homework problems, once you get the time, you can use that over here in this equation. And so if I put time in here, and remember the angle is zero, and so I'll just remind you that cosine of zero is one, and then we got the x, because we're going to measure how far it goes, we can then solve for what they've asked, the knot. And so that's the, the strategy. And so since I'm your hands to make the measurements, I'm going to measure this and set up the cannon for this and then I'm going to actually pause it and say you need to calculate the time and the initial velocity and I'll even do the calculations myself and so when I unpause the video camera I'm going to have an answer but hopefully you will have an answer first and hopefully our answers will agree okay to find out how fast does this little cannon shoot. And that's step one. So, without reading further down on the procedure, let me actually measure these. And, and here's how we're going to do it. Uh, the first one's pretty easy, and that's the, the vertical. Because I'm going to fire it here horizontally, and it's going to go across the floor. And our floor is roughly, and I'll say roughly, horizontal. So I'm going to assume that the distance from down here to the floor is the same as what it falls. Although our room does have a little slope. All labs do, because we put a little drain over there in case something goes wrong. So unlike a house, we don't want a level floor. We want a slope to it. And, uh, but the drain's far enough away that I... Uh, we're going to take that as negligible. Okay, so I have myself a two meter stick and again I'm your hands here so I'm going to place the two meter stick with zero on the ground and then measure up to the bottom of the ball and they have a little plastic mark right here so it looks like it's 116 centimeters and I don't know because of this plastic piece if I can do any better and I don't know if that's level but actually it looks like it is a little more I'll call it 116.3 okay now the 116 is centimeters, so let me change that to meters. So 1.163 meters. Careful. It lands at a negative distance. Maybe this is worth looking at the picture over here, right? I've technically just measured up 1.163 meters. But this equation means where is the position of the ball in reference to zero. So picking zero as the launch point and noting that it lands below where it started, I would then say it needs to be a negative. And when you go to do the math, that's real important because if you don't put a negative here, later on you're going to try to take a square root <laughs> and you'll be trying to take the square root of a negative number and you'll be going, that, I can't do that. <laughs> something went wrong. Yep, something did go wrong. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong, but this is an easy one to overlook, not putting the negative for the Y. Now the X is a little harder to measure 
because we actually have to fire it and, and see where it lands. And so I've got a little technique for that. Um, my technique starts with this. It starts with me firing it the first time to get a rough idea. Because the second time I'm going to put something that I can measure it better with. Now to help me, I'm going to grab a piece of paper <laughs> and I'm just going to put the paper roughly on the ground. I have no idea if I will hit that paper, but at least once I shoot it, I'll be able to then say, oh, I need to move the paper because I want the ball to land on the paper, okay? And so this will just give me a rough idea. So I'm going to guess that it's right about there. I'm going to just kind of eyeball to make sure the paper is straight down the spine of my cannon, and it sort of is. Maybe I'll move it a little bit more. And I don't know, Ron, if you want to watch from here or put the video camera down where it lands, whatever you think is best. Uh, maybe we'll shine it at the paper so they can kind of see it. And I'll just count. You guys can hear me. Release it on three. One, two, three, fire. Ah. So I hope what you guys saw is that it landed just a little beyond the paper, right about here. So I'm going to try to put that in the middle of the paper, thinking now when I shoot it, it's going to hit the paper. In fact, I'm so confident that it will hit the paper that I'm going to just tape the paper on the ground so that when I measure distances, it uh, won't move. And I'm also going to play a little game here or trick by putting what is referred to as carbon paper. And what it is is this black paper. And I'll put another sheet right here. And if I bounce the ball on it, you'll see that the impact of the ball leaves a little smudge. And so I don't need that piece of paper. But what I'm hoping it happens here is that I will hit the carbon paper and it'll leave a smudge so I know where it landed and then I can carefully measure the horizontal distance. And so that's how we're going to measure this together. Oh, keep bumping this. My sound still good, Ron? I should double check that. Yeah, I suppose you should check to make sure the camera is still working. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Sounds good? All right. All right. So, yeah, point it at me for just a second so they can see me load it. But now we're actually ready to make the measurement. So I'm going to load it up. I'll double check that the angle is zero. Sometimes me bumping it around can change, but that still looks good at, at zero. I'll double check that it's still straight down the, the spine. That looks good. Okay. And I suppose, Ron, why don't you point it at the paper? Maybe they'll see it go. I don't know which is better to see. And on the count of three, I'll shoot it and hopefully it'll skip off that uh, carbon paper and leave a smudge. One, two, three. Oh, I barely hit it. I wonder if I messed it up. But I think it did get the edge of it. Well, I didn't get too far to it. Oh, right there. Is it really? Yeah. So there's a, a smudge. Do you think I should shoot it again? Yeah. All right. Maybe I'll move the paper over a hair. I wonder if I bumped it when I pulled it. Oh yeah, you know, I don't think my clamp's very tight. Let me, okay. All right, oh good, well we get a fire another time because this is kind of fun anyway, so, so maybe we should miss it a couple of times. <laughs> All right, so let me load it up. Uh, let me look at zero. 
Let me look down the spine. Let me try to be a little more careful when I pull it so I don't twist it. On the count of three, one, two, three. Ah, there we go. And so now, I bet you can see the little smudge right there. Okay? And so there's the smudge mark. And so now, let me measure how far that is. All right, so remember this big long two meter stick. I'm going to place this two meter stick kind of near the ground, but I'm gonna take advantage of a sh few short measurements here. It looks like the ball gets launched at about two centimeters back from this edge. And this edge is at the edge of the table. And this lip hangs over by about two centimeters. And so I would say that if I put the zero of the two meter stick straight down from the edge of this wood, it would be right over that lip, which is right where the ball gets launched. And who knows, maybe I'm off by a centimeter or, or so, okay? So it went a pretty good distance. And I need a, that looks pretty good. Go right towards that, that smudge, okay? Uh, no. Nah. No, Ron was asking me. Normally, I have the students tape it because there's so many other people walking around. But uh, right now, we don't have that. It's just me doing the experiment. So I'll just kind of tap this here, and you'll see then that uh, this must be three meters. And that would be 3.2. And we're just shy of 3.3. Maybe I'll take the kind of the center of that smudge. So 3.294. 294. I better write that down right away. 294. 294. Ah. And so. 3.294 meters. Just shy of 3.3. All right, well, we're only on step one, but this is gonna be a good place for our first stop and let you guys do some work now. And I'm gonna say this, that I've measured the X and the Y and set up the angle, so you know these three. Use these equations that I talked about and calculate the time and then calculate the initial velocity. And then we will have accomplished step one. All right, see you in a second. Bye now. All right, so now I've unpaused it. I hope you took the time to do that, because I did. It's right here. I'm kind of hiding it from you, but I am going to give you a, a little bit of hint. I first calculated the time using this equation, and I got a number that's a little bit under a half a second. Okay, and uh, you should have too. Then, once I got that time, remember I put it into this equation, and I got what this was asking for, the initial speed. And I got a speed that is under seven, but more than six and a half, okay? And so, again, maybe I won't tell you the exact speed, but I want you to go through those calculations. Because you're gonna need those moving forward. Or actually, you only need one of them. You need the initial speed. Because here's our thinking. Our thinking is, if we were to change the angle on that cannon, 
we're going to assume it still fires at that same speed. So this was the point of calculating the initial speed when we fire it horizontally, hoping then if we change the angle, it would still fire and it, at the same speed. And, and, it, and it does that pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So let's use that to our advantage. Watch, let's, let's keep going on here. All right, so now that I wrote down these answers, let's go to step two. Step two says, set up your cannon to fire at an angle greater than 45 degrees. Okay, so I'm going to kind of loosen this up a little bit and give it an angle right about there. Kind of a lob. So it's going to go pew, up in the air. But if you remember before we actually started doing this, I was hitting the wall. So I want to give it a little more of a lob. Oh, I don't want to hit the ceiling. I, I, I think we'll be okay. I don't think we're going to hit the ceiling. Okay? Because uh, in the past, I know I hit the ceiling if I go more than 70 degrees. And I'm a hair under 60. I'll, I'll measure it more, more accurate. All right? All right. So I did step two with uh, you, with us. Step three. Here's the fun part. It says, measure your angle and then calculate how far this should go horizontally. All right, uh, let me start setting up a, a table here. Because my table is essentially the same. Remember, the first time I, I set it up at theta equaling zero. So this time, I'm going to set it up at theta equaling fifty-nine degrees. Yeah, maybe I'll even just tighten it up a little bit so it doesn't move on me. Let me just check. Still at fifty-nine. Okay, so. We have a pretty good angle here, 59 degrees. And I would say that we know a couple of things as we fire this cannon. First of all, we know the why. Now, it might be hard to tell on the video camera, but when this cannon pivots like I did, and I don't want to touch it too much, it pivoted right where the ball gets launched. So it did not raise or lower the ball. The ball is still being fired right there. Uh oh, lost the ball. Oh, I really lost it. Oh, it went way over here. Okay. So you are to no. Huh? Oh, yeah, I better check, see if I bumped it off of 59. Thank you. Yep, still, fi still 59. But what I'm trying to say then is for this calculation, we know that even though it's going to lob up pretty high, it's going to fall back down and land somewhere over here on the floor. And so its final position is going to be that negative 1.163 meters. Okay? Now, the firing velocity is, I'm just going to put the same. This was really the whole reason of doing this first step was to find that number. And it won't be perfectly like that, but we're going to assume it is and see what happens. And so, okay, now when I fire it a second time, we're going to say it still fires at that same speed. Okay, even though it's kind of angled up a little bit, it's got to fight gravity a little bit. But for the most part, it'll be the, that same. So, we then know these what could we calculate? Yeah. 
And I claim, coming back to this equation, that if I look at it, let's see. I know the y. I know the initial speed. I know the angle. I know everything in here but time. I can solve for time. Now, be careful because remember I said when you were firing at zero degrees, we calculated a time and it was under a half a second. But it's not the same amount of time. Now, now we're lobbing it up. And so I expect the time over here in this calculation to be quite a bit bigger. Okay? Much more than a half a second. But of course, what we're, we're, we're asked to calculate is where it will land, where the X is. And so that's going to be your assignment. And I'm going to hit pause here on the video camera and, and uh, have you hit pause and say, okay, now what I want you to do is to sit down and do a calculation. First calculating the time and then calculating how far it will go. And I, I'll do the same thing. Okay. And so over here, I will tell you that if you use the Y motion to calculate time again and then put it into here, you will get how far this should go. So it's kind of like a, like a homework problem. And so go ahead and hit pause and I'll hit pause and I'll do a calculation and then come back. All right, see you in a second. Okay, well, welcome back. I, I, I hope you took the time to do the calculations. I know I did, and they're right there. <laughs> and so this calculation for time, and so as I said, I put in this information into this calculation, and this is probably the hardest step here of the lab, and, and an important one for you to do is to make sure you can solve a quadratic equation. And so it is a quadratic, and you get a time of, and I won't tell you the exact number, but I will tell you that because it's quadratic, there's two answers. And one is a positive and one is a negative. Uh, I'll show you in the picture, but you want the positive one, not the, the negative one. In fact, coming over here to the picture, remember that the launching moment is called time equals to zero. So clearly it must hit the ground at a time greater than zero. And if you're kind of curious, like I was showing you on the homework, there is a reason why there is a negative time and the equations treat it as a constant acceleration, so it treats it for all negative times and all positive times. And obviously you could not calculate where it's gonna be after 100 seconds. That wouldn't work because it hits the floor, but the, the formula would tell you it's way down here or somewhere after 100 seconds. But the formula would also tell you that for a small amount of negative time, it's on its way up to get to here at zero, which it didn't really happen. So that's why we ignore that one. Just like anything after it hits the ground, we wouldn't say that's where it is. We ignore those numbers. In fact, this one I can probably give you. I got a negative 0.175 for that time seconds. and seconds. It's this one here that is the positive one. So again, without giving that number away and making you kind of go through the calculation, I'm hoping you got a number that was greater than one second, but less than two seconds. It kind of makes sense. Fire one, 1,002, and it's gonna hit before two seconds, but more than one second. In fact, it's even before a second and a half. So between one second and a second and a half is when it hits. Now, the main part of this problem, though, was to once you solve this harder one for time, you could put it back into the X motion and figure out how far it will go. And I got a number here, too. And again, without telling it to you, let me say that it is more than four meters. It is even more than four and a half meters but it is not five 
meters. And so the last step I will do here together is to put a target at where I calculated it and see if I can hit the target. All right. So I have put, if you want to bring the camera over here, Ron, here is the four meters and here is more than four meters. And so I think it's going to hit right about here. Actually, I calculated right about here, but I put it at the back because I do know from experience that when I angle the cannon up, it does fire a little slower than when I was firing it horizontally. And we did all of our calculations with the idea that it would fire at the same speed, and it, and it does not. So to give myself a little bit of extra leeway, I put the calculation distance at the back of the target and hopefully then it'll land somewhere just shy because of the smaller speed because I have it angled up. All right, well, let's give it a try. Although the other thing I want to test, click, click, click. And I'll check the angle here. So we're still at 59. Is I know that as I'm messing with it, it can kind of turn a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of look up the spine and make sure that my cannonball doesn't land just to the left or the right. It'd be terrible if I got the right distance and then I'm off to the left. It's like, ah, I did it and I missed. So I think I got it right. I think I looked up the spine really well. And let's give it a try and see if I hit the target. So on the count of three, I'll fire one, two, three. Oh yeah. And we got the target. And as you can see, it was just a little bit shy of what we calculated because of the uh, lower speed. So what are you going to turn in? These calculations. So do your calculations that would include the first big step what is the initial speed that your cannon fires or our cannon fires? And then finally, how far would it go when you set it up at this angle of 59 degrees? And then if you look there, the last part of the instruction said, put a target there and shoot at it. And that's where I came into the picture. I'm your hands. So I put the target there and we, and we hit it. So hopefully you're looking at four points and I'll leave it to you. All right. Till next time, take care.